Hello YouTube. Today we're going to look at Thomas Kuhn, uh, particularly his book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This book is uh, one of the most famous uh, and influential books of 20th century philosophy. Unlike most philosophy books, uh, it's, it's had an enormous impact on various other disciplines. So uh, it's, it's well worth reading. Uh, now, uh, what I'm going to do in this video is, is just explain Kuhn's general theory of scientific change. Uh, and in the next video, we'll look in a bit more detail at, at the philosophical implications of his theory. But this video is going to be just a bit more descriptive. So uh, the first thing I want to say about Kuhn is that he takes a very different approach to philosophy of science than all the other philosophers we've examined so far. The theories discussed in the previous videos are very abstract. They're based on general uh, logical or conceptual considerations. But Kuhn builds his philosophy on uh, detailed analyses of, of actual historical cases. Kuhn was trained as a historian of science and he brings a lot of that to bear on his philosophy. Uh, for, for people like the, uh, the hypothetico-deductivists and uh, for, for Popper and the falsificationists, Philosophy of science is, is basically a normative discipline. The, the point of philosophy of science is to describe the methodology that scientists ought to follow. It tells us how science should work in ideal circumstances. In principle, uh, there might never have been any people who actually uh, adopted this methodology. Um, and indeed, you know, we should certainly expect that in science, uh, since all humans are fallible, uh, people will often fail to follow proper methodology. So, from that point of view, the, uh, the, the, the history of science is not really that important. But, but for, for Kuhn and for many other philosophers, this kind of attitude is just wrong. Certain events in the history of science are clearly examples of good science, and any methodological proposals made by philosophers of science must be in line with those events. Or at any rate, if we want to understand how to do good science, surely the, the first thing we should do is examine actual examples of good science, like, say, Einstein's development of general relativity or Darwin's development of natural selection. If we want to understand how it is that science works so well, um, and we want to understand the methods that have allowed uh, science to become so successful, we need to look at scientific history. So, uh, with all of that said, Kuhn uh, believed that the history of science supported a kind of cyclical model of scientific change, which goes like this. Um, normal science leading to crisis, leading to revolution, leading to normal science, leading to crisis, to revolution, and, and so on. We have this cycle of, of normal science, crisis, revolution, normal science. So, uh, let's explain this uh, from the start. Normal science Normal science, uh, as the name implies, is what most scientists spend most of their time doing. It's uh, it's day-to-day it's -day quotidian research. If you go into the average scientific laboratory or university department, you'll probably encounter scientists doing normal science. Uh, now, the crucial point about normal science is that uh, in, in normal science, scientists all agree on the fundamentals, uh, on the fundamental claims and methods of their discipline. So recall that Popper emphasises constant criticism. For him, what's basic to science is this process of trying to attack and overthrow theories. But Kuhn thinks that history shows that this is almost exactly wrong. Uh, Kuhn says, and I quote, it is precisely the abandonment of a critical discourse that marks the transition to a science. If scientists spent all their time attacking fundamental assumptions, they'd never get any, any detailed work done. Uh, in, in practice, most scientists basically just all agree. Uh, most science is kind of boring. It's, kind of, it's just day-to-day uh, day -day quotidian stuff. Uh, so another quote from, from Kuhn, he says, Effective research scarcely begins before a scientific community thinks it has acquired firm answers to questions like the following. What are the fundamental entities of which the universe is composed? How do these interact with each other and in what sense? What questions may legitimately be asked about such entities and what techniques employed in seeking solutions? In normal science there is agreement on all of these questions. Scientists share a general picture of the universe and they all agree on how it should be investigated. 
Uh, now, Kuhn introduced the term paradigm to describe this situation. Uh, you uh, have to be quite careful here because Kuhn uses this term in many different ways. Uh, famously, Margaret Masterman claimed to find uh, 21 different interpretations of the term. But broadly speaking, a paradigm is a framework through which the, science, the scientist interprets the world. A paradigm supplies a general picture of what the world is like. It tells us what problems are important, what kind of questions are to be asked, what methods we should use for gathering data, how experiments and instruments should be designed, how results should be interpreted, and so on. A paradigm is a way of doing science. Uh, and, and each scientific discipline in, in normal science has its own paradigm. So uh, Peter Godfrey Smith gives this example for modern molecular genetics. Uh, genetics gives us a general picture of its domain based on principles such as the following. Uh, first, genes are made of DNA, or sometimes RNA, um, but you know it's, it's d d DNA or RNA. Uh, second, genes code for proteins and they also regulate other genes. Uh, third, information flows from DNA to protein, never from protein to DNA. This third one is known as the central dogma of molecular biology. And then we find uh, various techniques um, like uh, complementation tests, polymerase chain reaction, in situ hybridization and so on. All of this is part of the paradigm of modern genetics. Now, an important part of uh, a paradigm is exemplars. An exemplar is a specific scientific achievement that is taken to uh, sort of define the broader paradigm. So in genetics the exemplar might be Mendel's experiments on pea plants or uh, Crick and Watson's discovery of uh, the double helix structure of DNA. Exemplars have the function of inspiring and directing further research. So, so essentially uh, the, the later scientists try to do research that is sufficiently like the exemplar. They use exemplars as models for further research. So whereas most philosophers have tended to emphasize the learning of rules and the learning of uh, kind of algorithmic methods, uh, so most, most philosophers think that you open a scientific textbook and that gives you particular rules for doing science in that domain, for Kuhn, the main way that scientists approach problems is by trying to emulate exemplars. And obviously there's a lot of room for interpretation about the, uh, the degree to which a piece of research is like an exemplar. So this allows for a lot of creativity within uh, normal science. Uh, Kuhn, Kuhn thinks that what you really get from, uh, from, from textbooks are, are these kind of exemplars. And, and the exemplars, they, they show you this is what good science is. And then you try to uh, then you try to emulate the exemplars in later research. So, uh, with this idea of paradigm in mind, uh, we can say that normal science occurs when all scientists are united under one paradigm. As the quotes we saw earlier uh, suggest, Kuhn thinks that this is how science works most of the time. Right, most of the time, each scientific field is governed by just one paradigm. Scientists achieve a wide consensus. And it's this consensus on the paradigm that allows them to work collectively, cooperatively, in, in a kind of organized and co coordinated structure. This, this cooperative work that's focused on a small range of problems given by the paradigm, this is what produces the very detailed understanding of phenomena that is so characteristic of, of modern science. Uh, science gives us incredible depth, incredible depth of understanding. And for Kuhn, the, the, what, what produces this is, is the consensus in, and the somewhat dogmatic consensus. Uh, it's this just wide agreement on a whole range of, of uh, issues and methods that allows us to achieve detailed understanding. So as an example of this kind of consensus, Kuhn considers uh, theories of light. Today, basically all scientists agree, and they've agreed for many decades, on the nature of light. They hold that light is composed of photons, elementary particles that exhibit, uh, well, they exhibit what wave particle duality. Um, so, so the light has properties of both waves and particles. 
Now, if we go back to the 1800s, things were quite different, but uh, there was still consensus. Back then, it was held that light was uh, a transverse wave, and it was held that this wave propagates in a, a subtle substance that permeates all of space, known as the luminiferous ether. Go back another century, and the accepted theory was the corpuscular theory, uh, due to Newton and Descartes, which treated light as composed of small particles. Um, now, the point is that although the theory of light changes over time, if we take it at any one time, what we tend to find is a strong consensus on a particular theory. In the 1800s, there was a strong consensus on the wave theory. Today, there's a strong consensus on the photon theory. But if we go back before the 1600s or so, Kuhn claims that there just was no consensus like this. He says, uh, no period between remote antiquity and the end of the 17th century exhibited a single generally accepted view about the nature of light. Instead, there were a number of competing schools and subschools, most of them espousing one variant or another of Aristotelian, Epicurean, or Platonic theory. So it was only once this situation of constant criticism and debate over fundamentals was abandoned uh, that our study of light became properly scientific. Um, it was only when the study of light began proceeding under a single uh, shared paradigm that it became a science. Before then, um, there, was, there was no consensus, and although there may have been interesting ideas, we, we didn't have something that was, that was a genuine science. So that's... Uh, a kind of example of, of the importance of uh, achieving a consensus. Now Kuhn characterised uh, normal science as puzzle solving. Um, a puzzle is something that isn't yet explained in terms of the paradigm. And when doing normal science, scientists try to solve, solve such puzzles. So they, they try to interpret the world in terms of their paradigm. Uh, as Kuhn says, normal science is and I quote, an attempt to force nature into the preformed and relatively inflexible box that the paradigm provides. Uh, and there are various aspects uh, to, to puzzle solving. First of all, uh, normal science involves uh, developing and articulating the theory. So, for example, determining theoretical constants, like the gravitational constant, the Boltzmann constant, the electron charge, the mass of the proton, and so on or determining certain basic facts like uh, stellar positions and magnitudes, the structure of proteins, the interaction of different chemicals, the strength of gravity at various points on the Earth. Uh, development of the theory uh, will also involve trying to extend the theory to other fields in order to explain other phenomena. Obviously one important part of normal science is generating and testing predictions, but it's crucial to note that, according to Kuhn, when a scientist tests predictions during normal science, it is not the, the, it's not the paradigm that's tested, but the scientist. Uh, so general relativity, for example, predicts uh, gravitational waves, which are essentially uh, ripples in the structure of sp in the uh, curvature of space-time. Now, what Kuhn would say is that if a scientist's experiments fail to detect gravitational waves, that will usually be considered not a failure of relativity theory, but instead a failure of the scientist conducting the tests. Gravitational waves exist, you just need to be clever enough to find them. As the saying goes, it's a poor carpenter who blames his tools. And of course, when we look at the history of science, this does seem to be the case, at least to some extent. We have now uh, successfully detected gravitational waves uh, just uh, last year, but for many decades, attempts were made and they continually failed. And yet this didn't really lead anybody to seriously doubt relativity theory. Um, it, it, it was just a failure of the experiments. And this is why Kuhn calls normal science puzzle solving. Puzzles have solutions. The question is whether the individual is ingenious enough to find the solution. Some of the puzzles that scientists uh, work on in normal science are anomalies. Anomalies are results that seem to contradict the assumptions of the paradigm. All paradigms face anomalies. Uh, there will always be some phenomena that don't fit well with our theories. Uh, and part of the work of normal science is resolving these anomalies, uh, coming up with ways to make the paradigm accommodate the phenomena. 
in the last video I uh, gave the example of the orbit of Venus, uh, uh, of Uranus rather. The orbit showed certain discrepancies from the predictions of Newtonian mechanics and therefore constituted an anomaly for that paradigm. Uh, the anomaly was resolved by the postulation of an eighth planet um, which, which was later confirmed. So to, to sort of sum this up, uh, the crucial thing to see here is that for Kuhn, normal science is is kind of dogmatic. Uh, dog, dogmatic thinking is in some ways the key to the success of, of normal science. Most scientists, most of the time, do not take a critical attitude to the paradigms that they work with. Now, of course, particular specific hypotheses may be challenged and refuted, but the overall paradigm, the organising framework for doing science, is shielded from refutation. For example, we might find a modern biologist challenge the view that uh, birds are descended from theropod dinosaurs, and they might pre present evidence, so you know, fossil evidence or genetic evidence or whatever, um, that straightforwardly shows that actually, yes, birds do have a different ancestry. But the overarching paradigm of Darwinian evolutionary theory cannot simply be displaced or even really challenged by the normal scientific processes. Biologists won't try to challenge it. The, the Darwinian paradigm is taken as an assumption that then guides their investigation of the world. So that's normal science. Now, the work of normal science can't continue forever. Normal science is structured so that it eventually gives way to crisis and revolution. So I said that one part of normal science is resolving anomalies. However, some anomalies are recalcitrant. Attempts to resolve them, even by the brightest minds of the field, continually fail. Uh, initially, a recalcitrant anomaly may simply be ignored, but over time, these recalcitrant anomalies start to build up. And this leads scientists to start losing confidence in their paradigm. A good example of this can be found in Newton's theory. Uh, Newtonian mechanics is an extremely powerful theory of the world. Uh, back in the 1800s, most people would have considered it just about the best scientific theory ever proposed. But it ran into a problem with the orbit of Mercury. Uh, it was known that the, uh, the point of closest approach, or the perihelion, of the orbit of the planets is not always in the same place, but it, it moves around the sun. Uh, this is known as the precession of the perihelion. So planetary orbits look something like this, uh, although the effect here is uh, greatly exaggerated. Um, but the point is that the, the, the point of closest approach to the sun uh, moves. As the planet kind of goes around in its orbit, the part where it's closest moves around. That's the precession of the perihelion. And this precession is due to the gravitational influence that the planets have on, on, on each other. Now, Newton's theory correctly predicts the precession of the perihelion for, for all the planets except Mercury. Newton's theory predicts that Mercury's orbit will show a precession of 5,557 arc seconds per century. Uh, arc seconds is a measure of apparent size as seen from the Earth. Uh, from the Earth, the Moon is about 1,800 arc seconds. Jupiter, at its closest, is something like 50 arc seconds. Saturn is 20 arc seconds. Um, so it's, it's, it's apparent distance, not actual, um, not actual size. Uh, so every century uh, from Earth, we will observe Mercury's perihelion precess by just over three times the apparent size of the Moon. Uh, so it's 5,557 5, arc seconds. However, the precession of Mercury's perihelion was actually measured to be uh, 5,600 arc seconds per century. And there was a discrepancy uh, from Newton's theory of about 43 arc seconds per century. Uh, just as a side point, you might note the incredible degree of observational accuracy that was attained here. Uh, Mercury's observed orbit deviates from the prediction of Newtonian mechanics by a degree that is less than the apparent size of Jupiter per century. So that's a, a pretty striking measurement, especially for the, for the time in the 1800s. Anyway, in order to account for this discrepancy, scientists postulated that there must be another planet closer to the Sun whose gravitational force was influencing Mercury's orbit. This planet was named Vulcan, and based on, how, based on the, the, uh, the way it was influencing Mercury's orbit, it was possible to work out 
its probable mass and its orbit and you can use that to figure out where it will be and hopefully detect it. Unfortunately, attempts to detect Vulcan continually failed. Um, there were plenty of reports that Vulcan had been observed, but these all turned out to be spurious. Now, at first this could be attributed to the difficulty of observing an object so close to the glare of the sun, but as more astronomers with better equipment searched and they still failed to find it, astronomers uh, tried to, to alter their hypothesis. They tried out different masses and different orbits for Vulcan, but still nothing was found. It was even proposed that perhaps it was not a single planet, but a collection of asteroids called Vulcanoids. Um, but, but again, I mean, we, we just failed to detect these things. So what we have with Mercury's orbit is, is this nagging problem for Newtonian mechanics that just wouldn't go away, and it started to shake people's confidence. And then, of course, a, a few other anomalies began to arise for the standard physics of the time, most famously the null result of the michelson morley experiment, which I mentioned in the last video. The point is that here we have cases where observations continually contradict a theory and nobody is able to get the theory and observation back into agreement. Scientists put a lot of effort into resolving the anomaly but they continually fail and this starts to put pressure on the paradigm. And at this point we enter what Kuhn calls a period of crisis. Crises happen relatively infrequently they only occur after various nagging anomalies have built up. During a crisis, scientists feel that their paradigm is no longer fully efficient. They start to become more critical. They start to wonder about other approaches. Uh, new novel theories start to proliferate. This state of crisis might persist for years or even decades. Now, one important thing that uh, I do want to make clear is that there's no uh, kind of rule um, for what will uh, what will prompt a crisis. Just because uh, an anomaly is present, that doesn't necessarily mean that a crisis will occur. So I, I mentioned the example earlier of gravitational waves. For a long time we kept failing to detect them. Now that might be considered a persistent anomaly for general relativity, but it never caused a crisis. And one of the main reasons for this is probably that general relativity continued to be so massively successful in so many other respects. Notice as well that uh, that, that with Newton's theory uh, and the problem of Mercury's orbit, well, Newton had a great deal of uh, previous success at predicting orbits. Uh, indeed, the prediction of the return of Halley's Comet was one of its first major successes. So one of the reasons why Mercury's orbit was so troubling is that this is an area where Newton's theory should have worked. And that's an area where it, in fact, did work remarkably well uh, up until that point. But the same, of course, isn't really true of gravitational waves. Uh, it's not that there had been a lot of successes at observing some kinds of gravitational waves, but then we kept failing to observe other ones. So uh, the point is just that whether or not a persistent anomaly causes a crisis is going to depend on many factors. The, the mere existence of the anomaly is not enough. Anyway, once we have a crisis, there are two ways it can be resolved. First, uh, maybe some ingenious scientist will come along who's able to show that the apparent anomalies actually can be explained in terms of the current paradigm. That will save the current paradigm and normal science in terms of that paradigm is resumed. Second, more interestingly, a wholly new paradigm might be proposed. This is a wholly new way of seeing the world and of doing science. This is something radically different to the status quo. And if this new paradigm is capable of solving the old problems, if scientists find it convincing, we get a scientific revolution or a paradigm shift. So, according to Kuhn, uh, rejection of a paradigm uh, only occurs when, when we have two conditions. Firstly, uh, nagging anomalies have accumulated. And again, th these have to be anomalies that scientists find troubling, that they find nagging. Uh, and second, a new paradigm is proposed. And this, of course, contrasts with Popper and the falsificationists. According to Kuhn, we don't immediately throw out theories in the face of anomalies. Scientists will persist with actually a, quite a bad paradigm uh, if it faces a few problems or if, it, or if there are no alternatives. Perhaps another way of putting this is to say that the precession of Mercury's perihelion and the michelson morley exper experiment only became a falsifier of the older, older physics once Einstein's alternative was proposed. Before Einstein, these were seen as substantial problems, but they were not treated as falsifications. 
Uh, they were, you know, the older physics was not thrown out on, on the basis of these problems because there just was no good alternative. Um, now, of course, even when the new paradigm is proposed, the old paradigm will retain adherence. Paradigm shifts don't happen overnight. It can take years or decades. During this period, which Kuhn calls revolutionary science, things work very differently uh, to normal science. Whereas in normal science, uh, science is, is tightly structured and orderly and all the scientists follow the same methods, in revolutionary science, uh, the situation becomes chaotic and all of the rules are up in the air. Fundamental questions are again open to debate. Revolutions are, are radical discontinuities in the ordered quotidian work of normal science. Now, importantly, uh, the debate between two paradigms cannot be settled by experiment and logic alone, uh, but it instead depends on more social, more psychological factors. Indeed, Kuhn held that a paradigm shift is something like a religious or political conversion. He says, uh, the transfer of allegiance from paradigm to paradigm is a conversion experience that cannot be forced. Why is this? Well, remember that paradigms define the kinds of questions to be asked, the methods by which scientists should address them, the standards of evaluating theories, and so on. Proponents of different paradigms have different standards, uh, and they, they will make different claims about the problems that science should try to solve. But in that case, the evaluation of a paradigm is necessarily circular. As Kuhn says, uh, each group uses its own paradigm to argue in that paradigm's defence. So since the standards of evaluation are supplied by the paradigm, the arguments in favour of a particular paradigm will be convincing only to those who already accept the paradigm. Uh, Kuhn claimed that competing paradigms are incommensurable. Uh, incommensurability is an extremely important topic uh, in philosophy of science, and we'll explore it in much more detail in the next video. Uh, but, but broadly speaking, the, the idea of incommensurability is that there is no common measure. Uh, so, so we don't have universal standards or, me or methods by which to compare two paradigms. So we can't rationally compel somebody to give up their paradigm in favour of ours. And unsurprisingly, many philosophers have found this claim quite disturbing. Kuhn seems to be saying that actually the most significant cases of scientific change were not rational processes. And furthermore, this seems to threaten the idea of scientific progress. We have progress during normal science because in normal science all scientists have a shared basis for evaluating theories and experiments, but during revolutions that shared basis drops away. It looks like we've got no independent grounds for treating the new paradigm as being better than the old one. Now Kuhn himself does say that there is progress through revolutions in that the new paradigm will have an increased puzzle-solving power. The new paradigm will resolve the anomalies that afflicted the old one, and it will also solve various other puzzles as well. But, you know, we, we might worry whether Kuhn is really entitled to say this. The problem is that you know, what counts as a puzzle and what counts as a good way of solving a puzzle and so on, again, these are things that are determined by your paradigm. So for the people working in the new paradigm, it will certainly seem like it has greater puzzle-solving power, but they're evaluating its puzzle-solving power from the point of view of their own paradigm. There is no... Uh, independent way of uh, determining which has the greater puzzle-solving power, or, or so Kuhn's view would seem to imply. Uh, so, so this is um, quite radically different and quite uh, quite a bit more challenging, perhaps, than some of the other uh, theories we've seen. Anyway, that's Kuhn's model of scientific development. We have normal science under a particular paradigm, uh, where anomalies gradually build up to a crisis which causes a revolution or paradigm shift, and then normal science under a different paradigm uh, is resumed. Of course, Kuhn doesn't claim that every event in the history of science follows this model, but he does think that in general uh, we, we're going to find this sort of pattern. So here are some examples. I won't go through them in you know, any detail, but you can, you know, you can look them up online if, if you're interested. So to sum all of this up then, um, Peter Godfrey Smith suggests that what's crucial in Kuhn's theory is that it treats science as a mechanism that combines two capacities. 
One of these capacities is embodied in normal science, and this is the capacity for uh, focused cooperative work on specific problems. And this allows science to obtain an extremely detailed understanding of natural phenomena. This kind of work is orderly and it follows clear standards. But this uh, detailed work under normal science will generate anomalies for the paradigm, which eventually leads to crisis and ultimately overthrow of the paradigm. And, and this is where we see the, uh, the other capacity in science, a capacity for, for radical change, which occurs during paradigm shifts. This process is disorderly and standards are up in the air. Uh, eventually a new framework emerges and normal science continues. For Kuhn, the success of science lies in the tension between, uh, between these periods of dogmatism and then these short bursts of radical debate, yeah, the, these more chaotic, uh, ca chaotic debates. Um, so that's Kuhn's theory. Uh, as I said, we'll look at the philosophical implications of it more in the next video, where um, I'll focus mainly on incommensurability between different paradigms and some of the problems that that raises. Uh, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching.